come through wasn't clear, just stop me because I can talk and talk. I love talking. I love teaching. And I wanted to start that I was excited that um, we get this chance because even if it's virtual, we hear in my art studio. So um, this is a space where art happens. Um, not only my art, but I actually have about 40 students and I teach my students here. Um, I named my school about a year ago, Z Art Academy. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that what I'm teaching is not just a skill. I'm hoping what I'm teaching is the passion for the arts and more, what is making art? Making art is a way of seeing. So I'm hoping people how to see. And if we were to define, if you asked me to define what is painting and what is the job of the painter is to be, and I'm kind of jumping the gun because we're gonna talk more about this. Um, I think the artist is, is um, it's an it's a organ. If we think about a human body, the artist is the, 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 the organ of the vision for the society. Most of us, most of us, sometimes myself included, we spend blinded. We can spend the entire life not seeing, not noticing. Uh, we can watch movies and uh, go out, but we still don't notice. We don't, still don't see. And I hope that we can come to this conclusion, what I mean by this. I think what you do in your studying, when you read, when you learn, that's a way of seeing too. So if I have to ask, what is my greatest job? It is to, to see and to help others see and to teach others how to see. And so I wanted to show you the actual space. I'm gonna zoom the camera around. It's a little bit uh, not so technologically advanced, but I still want you to feel as if you walked into my studio. So I want to welcome you to the space and I wanna show you a little bit around. So sorry for the shaking camera. Is this okay? Raise your hand if this is okay to do. Yes, cool. All right, so we're gonna pan around. I'm gonna try to do this. Uh, this is actually a painting on an easel that I'm working on that's not finished. And with all the models gone, my 12-year-old my daughter is modeling. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the scale of this works. So I'm going to walk over there so you could see me. I'm gonna go and estimate. Can you see me? Wow, yes. Okay, so just, just to give you a sense of the scale. And that's why I didn't wanna just show you in, in photographs. Uh, these are all the newest works. Um, they are installed here. They're installed beautifully because I was e expecting Rotem to come for a studio visit. visit. <laughs> and I hung it to look like a museum in here. I wanted to knock her socks off. And now you get the virtual experience. So this is. Yeah, it's working digitally as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is all the latest work. I, I hide my old work. I don't like to look at my old work because. Um, we tend to repeat things that we see in our periphery. We tend to repeat things. I'm going to come back around to myself now. That works. Is this good? Can you see me? Yes. Okay. So we tend to repeat things. So I, uh, even these paintings that you see in the studio, uh, when I'm working, I cover them up with uh, cloths. I don't want to see what I've done before. It's always as if you're starting fresh, like nothing ever existed. No Mona Lisa was painted, no Picasso, no Andy Warhol, no any Jenny Gershman whatsoever. Every time should be fresh. That's what I very strongly believe in. So this was just to kind of give you um, a, a feeling, a sense of being in the studio. If there's one more thing I really want to show you, I'll try to walk up there. Uh, what I really want to show you, grab, grab my computer. This is the blood. This is the DNA. This, uh, what we call oil paint, is actually can become anything you want in the world. So I really, um, I'm a really great romantic when it comes to painting. And I believe that I'm working with alchemical materials. They're not just oil paint but they're living thing, a living substance that uh, I'm not making paintings, but I am trying to get closer to what is the mystery of it all. Um, it's a big hat to wear, it's a big thing to say, but that's where the drive comes from. Uh, that's the reason I don't take photographs. That's the reason why I keep on painting. Uh, there is a moment when you paint, when you see there's, there's just brush strokes. You, you know the formula, you know, You've got to paint dark to light. You've got to put the proportion. You know the anatomy. 
And then there is a magical moment when these brush strokes start staring back at you. And that moment is really addictive. This is, this is the mystery of what, what, what we're doing. And I suppose that that happens also when you read an interesting text where you don't feel, you know that you're holding the book, you know that you're looking at the text, you know you're studying, and all of a sudden the distance between you and the text disappears, and you're in some space that never existed before that is based both on the viewer, the reader, and the text itself. That is, that is a little bit, if I was to give you a sense of what it feels like here, creating or teaching, or having you here welcome at the studio. So the, the, before I go any further, I wonder if anybody has uh, any questions, any comments, anything that you'd like to add before we keep going. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm very interested in your like, beginner's mind idea when you're saying that, you know, approach it as if you've never approached it before. Um, can you just explain a little bit more about what you mean? Because um, I think as an artist, you mean something else from what I might assume you mean by that. So I'm just interested in that comment. Uh, can, you, can you just a little bit, can you tell me what it means to you? To pro, you mean in terms of in the realm of art or just in general? In general, beginner's mind. Beginner's mind for me means, I'll put it this way, like my, my art form, like I'm sure others on this call is Torah. And so for me, like the most exciting thing that could possibly happen in the study of Torah is that I meet, I, I meet a teacher who will give an insight or say something or show a different method. And it makes me feel like I'm looking at the whole thing as if I'm doing it for the first time. Yeah. And that's happened to me multiple times already. Uh, and that's what keeps me going of, you know, you think you know something and then you realize like, you know it in one sense, but you have, but now you get to meet it in a totally new sense. And for me, that's beginner's mind. Um, I would, it's beautifully said, Brett, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, Brett, beautifully described. It is an absolute, that's the addiction for me. That is, that is the call to art, the great call to art. Um, I would add an interesting part to it because we keep saying, I keep saying, um, I see something for the first time, I hear something for the first time, beginner's mind, uh, but there's something else that happens. I think you would agree with me that that's what you mean as well, but neither of us have said it yet because of the constraint of language itself. Mm. When this happens, you actually watch yourself experience this. So the you disappears. It is you who is discovering this or may discover this or at the same time, you watch yourself perceive this, so you know it's bigger than you. So because of the constraint of the language, I say I have to say I create, right? But it's the, or I read, or I realize, or I discover. But that is already a lie. <laughs> because in a sense, you watch the potential of discovery that's happening with you, through you, and is big and uniting you to something that you didn't even know existed. And that's really the, the, the tzimis of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to go into, um, um, when I spoke to Rotem, she mentioned um, that she was interested in um, Jewish creativity, uh, basically an idea of a Jewish artist. What is a Jewish artist and how does it apply to me? And seemingly kind of an innocent question. Uh, but these are two concepts that are very, very complex, two in once. First big concept, what is a Jew? What is Jewish? And another impossible co co concept, what is an artist? And what the hell, what, what do they have in common? I mean, this is, we could spend a seminar, not just one, one hour, a few minutes, right? We could just- Oh, they know. They know that we can spend a seminar right? around An this. amazing, amazing thing. So, I thought, how can I make sense of it? When you look at my work, you might think of me as the least Jewish artist of them all. But the more you'll talk about me, the more you'll realize that's probably the opposite. So how do I reconcile? How do I explain to you what I mean by this? So first, what is Jewish to me, right? How does it come into my practice? I was born in USSR, in Soviet uh, country where the Jewish identity was ripped away from my family. My great grandfather was extremely religious 
And my grandfather, who was up to four years old before the Russian Revolution, has vague memories of my grandfather wrapping up in this strange, uh, of what looked to him strange devices, you know, and uh, wrapping up and waving and saying strange words. At four years old, that memory in our family was abruptly cut when the, uh, the, the Russian Revolution uh, forbid any kind of religious practicing. So it went from 100%, the most orthodox you can imagine, to zero, right? And it's somewhere in the back of the memory of my grandfather. Imagine if you're four, you've never really been explained anything. You just kind of are slowing, absorbing, and growing up, and that's it. It's cut in that family. So when I grew up, my mom always told me, Zhenya, you're Jewish. You should be proud of this. But what is mom? What is this? What do you mean? It's something very special. You, you, you're absolutely. That's all I could tell. Can you see me, Sam? You're a little. Uh, are you? Can you hear me? Yeah. You're, yeah, you're cutting out a bit. Yeah, you okay. got cut off for can a minute, you, but you're good. Okay. So, so there was this quality that I who I am. I know it's very important, but I don't know why, what it means. And there is a, a, an amazing philosopher that I love, a Russian philosopher, um, historian, uh, who had multiple PhD in, in different uh, religious studies, uh, incredible man. And he tried to grapple with, with the, idea of, uh, the idea of the chosen people, or what is the Jewish. And he said that every nation is chosen. The Jews are not chosen any more than any other nation. But each, each nationality, each people as, as a place, geographical place or spiritual place on earth has kind of a mission. And to him, and it really spoke to me, he identified what is Jewish? What is the mission? If you take everything away, if you took away all memory, all knowledge of the Torah, everything, 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 what is left is witnessing. Witnessing what? Witnessing God. That our job is to witness God. And as every witness, he says, if you go in court, you're not liked. You know, they're not going to like the witness. <laughs> uh, the witness often tells the truth where people don't want to hear the truth. Uh, the witness gives a guilt trip. The witness uh, reminds, acts as a reminder. And this is a beautiful and difficult job. And if I go back a little bit, I start speaking to you about the job of an artist. And I said this was the, the organ of the eye. If I had to reduce the job of the artist, is that one of the witness, if you will, if you're spiritual, it's witnessing God through your art. So this is how the crossroad for me, the importance of Judaism and what is an artist and what is the importance of the artist start to cross over. I'd love to keep going, but I wonder if any, any reactions, any association, thoughts, how it applies to your thinking, anything before we keep going. I just wonder, did it, what was the evolution like for you? And maybe I'll get to this, but to reintegrate that Judaism into your identity as you got in, as you kind of, integrated that also into your art? What does that look like when it kind of was stolen from you and then you didn't really have a sense of even how to ground yourself in that? And then how did that inform how you moved forward? So this happens uh, very interesting. Thank you for that question. Um, that happens very interesting to me. It happened from the most un um, unexpected place. It happened for my love of art history, my curiosity and my love of asking questions. And I'm really irreverent. I think that's probably a Jewish quality, right? You just don't settle with, but why? Why? But why? <laughs> Tell me more. This doesn't make sense, right? We don't just accept the tradition. We accept the living tradition. That's a very big difference, right? We don't repeat things. We keep asking and making it relevant. And, you know, that's how it's alive. For the moment it's stagnated, it's gone. So I was looking at uh, my passion, my, my favorite artist is Rembrandt, and it extends past Rembrandt to, to a little bit before him, about 100 years ago, to Renaissance, not the earliest parts of Renaissance, uh, for a Western European tradition, let's say 50, the art of 1500s. And I started noticing that a lot of my favorite artists were using Hebrew characters and symbols in their 
Christian European paintings. People like Albrecht Dürer, like Raphael, like Leonardo, some of the greatest artists. And I wanted to ask a question, what does it say? But I didn't even know how to write in Hebrew. I couldn't even send the letter and say, this is what I see, what does it mean and why it's there? I didn't even know how to pose a question. So I actually, this is how I first uh, ended up in American Jewish University. I came to uh, learn classical Hebrew because I wanted to know the characters, I wanted to be able to read, I wanted to have some basic understanding so I could simply pose the question. And you have to imagine that I'm sitting in the class uh, uh, at American Jewish University, there's about maybe five, six ladies and one guy, and they're going around the room and they're asking why are you in the class? So everybody had different reasons. Somebody had studied Judaism as a kid and forgot and came back to it. Uh, somebody was, you know, converted, converting, and they wanted to learn it. Somebody came from actually Christian faith, but uh, the Bible felt limiting, and they wanted to read it in original language, right? And then they came to me, and they said, young lady, why, because I was really a young lady there, there was, <laughs> everybody was kind of elderly, they said, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here to learn Judaism because of Albrecht Dürer, <laughs> <laughs> looked, the teacher looked at me like I was absolutely insane, but it was this uh, European artist that brought me there. And very quickly, I was able to figure out that what they were looking for is um, actually uh, Jewish mysticism and Jewish mystical traditions. And there was a huge overlap uh, between the rabbis, the mystical rabbis and the teachings in Renaissance in Europe, particularly, uh, ironically, in Germany. Germany was one of the most open-minded places in Europe 500 years ago. Things kind of change a little, but uh, this, this was the place. Nuremberg, which we get goosebumps hearing about today, was the place to go. Uh, that's where, where a lot of greatest intellectual minds were prospering. And I understood uh, that I need to study Kabbalah. I need to study, but I, where do you study Kabbalah? And eventually I got to American Jewish University to Pinhas Giller, and I was sitting with about four or five rabbinical students. And here I was as well. Um, I think there were two women in the class. And, uh, and uh, I sat there for about a year. At first, uh, a little bit more like a dog because mostly it was in Hebrew and I kind of just, you know, once in a while I, I heard like God and I would just jump, you know. Uh, and then eventually starting to understanding what he's talking about. And that set up me off on a very interesting spiritual journey um, and I started reading and studying Judaism much more in depth. I ended up with Rotem uh, uh, with a fellowship. And without knowing, my work absorbed some of these ideas. My work truly physically, metaphysically uh, uh, changed. And I can talk a little bit about some of the manifestations of that as well. Yes? So. Um, I also wanted to show you, um, before we go into specific bodies of work and the, the latest body of work, I wanted to show you this one image. So this is an, a painting. I'm going to put it down. You see it's very small, unlike all my other work. It's on paper. And it's a self-portrait. Hopefully you're able to recognize me. And the reason I show this because this painting was able to travel to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. It was a uh, part of Jerusalem, Jerusalem Biennale. And uh, the task of the Los Angeles artist who was selected to participate was to reflect on your Jewish identity and what it means. The very same question you're asking me today for your seminar, how to do it through visual language. And this is the piece that traveled among um, other a uh, number of artists and it was displayed in a kind of an artist book in a very beautiful way. Uh, before I say anything, I wonder if anything jumps at you, if there's any, if you had to describe it, if you had to, had some thoughts or questions about it, and then I'll tell you the story. What do you see or feel here? In a way, it reminds me of the image of the girl from Les Miserables. Which one? The girl from Les Miserables. Say more. 
Well, it's just that image of uh, there's this sort of anonymous character. Um, like I never thought the girl in Les Mis actually um, was like a little Cosette or was actually in the play. It was just more emblematic of an image of the French Revolution, um, sort of like a capturing of the feeling through the face mm-hmm. of innocence. Um, and that's what that evokes for me when I, like, when I look at your painting. That's what it reminds me of. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anybody wants to respond to that? That feels different, similar. There is no wrong answer. <laughs> Not in a necessarily a response, but it looks like it's very much trapping you. Like the red is just preventing you from, from being yourself and like only your eyes can come through and parts of your face, but it looks like it's very much, I'm talking in circles. It's, it's trapping who you are. You know, I want to talk to you a little bit and respond to what you had just said. Um, Kevin? Kevin, yes. Um, So the reason I love oil paint is because it becomes extremely transparent and you can dilute it and let that air, that layer dry like skin. So if we think about our skin, we could see some of the blue veins coming through. We could see all the layers. The the oil paint works the same way. And here there's multiple layers. One layer is missing here, but there's the red layer that creates already a barrier. It creates a physical space. There is no space in this painting. It's just the oil paint, where it's painted and where it's not, creating a, 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 a space where the face is looking out. So there's a behind, there is the middle ground where we could touch it, and there's forward to you. There's that space out there. All of that is just by a simple wash, right? So to get that reaction from you, for me is very exciting because there's no perspective in that painting, right? It's simply the material and how it works. Um, any other comments before I say anything? All right, so um, two things. What the Star of David means to me. I will probably say it in three ways. The very first time I received the Star of David was from my mother. And I was about probably 10 years old. And she ordered it, she drew it to a jeweler and secretly had it designed. One triangle was made out of silver, one triangle was made out of gold, and there were three little garnets like pomegranates in the heart of the star. It was very, very tiny. And she gave it to me and she said, Zhenya, this is what it means to be Jewish, going back to that story. This is the most powerful symbol, but we are in Russia. You can never, you have to swear that you will wear it every day, but you will never show it to anybody because it can cost you your life. So this was my introduction to what the Star of David is, right? The second time I was introduced to it, We immigrated to Los Angeles in 1991, and we were driving with our friends through Hollywood, and we just drove by Cedar Sinai. And what do you see on top of Cedar Sinai? A huge Star of David, right? Because it's built on all of the Jewish donations. It's a Jewish hospital, right? On Jewish charity. And my mother and my father saw this, and they started weeping. They were not crying. They were weeping because what this meant, if there was a Star of David on the building in Russia, it would be burned. That a building can celebrate the symbol was just unthinkable to her, right? And that the second memory is me watching my parents and, and trying to understand what that means to them, what it means to be free, something that I've been hiding my whole life. Now it's celebrated. And what is it, right? And the third uh, connection, well, four. <laughs> the mm-hmm. third connection to the Star of David was when I came to it um, as a symbol of Metatron through Kabbalah and through the art of Albrecht Durer. And a lot of my research was actually revolving around what this symbol will represent in a very, I mean, it's so multidimensional. It's so multidimensional. Um, I can send you the link. Um, I'm very excited about this. Uh, This is a Brill publication, which is impossible to get your article in unless it's truly academic, bullet proven, your theories are clean. And this is the largest journal in the world for the study of Western esotericism. And I have half of this journal, it's my research on Durer, 
uh, which began with my visit to uh, Pinhas. And this will explain to you why I'm so passionate about this symbol. And lastly, but not leastly, when I came to this country, I was 15 years old, and I met an amazing man who to me looked like he was 200 years old. He was 70. But you know, when you're 15 and somebody's 70, I feel maybe even 300, right? They're ancient. And this man was a colossal artist, a colossal Jewish artist. Um, he studied in a bow house. He was uh, studied with the blue ride. I mean, he was incredible. And he just absolutely fell in love with me and my art. I think he sort of adopted me because he and his wife decided to dedicate his life to art and they decided not to have children. So immediately he adopted me as a child and a grandchild. That was everything. And he called me, he nicknamed me Tiger. He only, he never called me Jenny. He just said Tiger. And said, Tiger, go get them. Tiger, go do this. Tiger, you have bright future. And he painted this paper. You see it in these little parts, the faded parts right here. He painted this. He took the paper and he took watercolor and he stained it. He made about 10 sheets this size. And he said, Tiger, you should experiment. You shouldn't just paint on white. You should expect, this is gonna give you juice to experiment. And this paper sat in my studio for 25 years. And David has long passed away. And when this project was requested, there was a particular size of the paper that we were constrained by. And when I opened the drawer, it was exactly the size of the paper he prepared for me. And his name was David. So this is the star of also David. So you can see how it comes from multiple dimension, mul multiple perspectives. Um, I'm gonna switch gears for just a moment. Let's look at some of the work that I sent to Rotem. Let's bring up that screen. Where do you wanna uh, start? The, the first image actually is interesting. Um, <laughs> If you want to talk about uh, a bad Jew, um, when I was, uh, it was time for me to get married, um, I wanted to have a ritual. And you can't really have a ritual without a religion. I mean, you can, but it's not as beautiful and exciting. And by default, it was going to be Judaism because I'm definitely not Christian, but I didn't know much about Judaism. And we, we ch chose a date because we were bad Jews, we chose actually a Sukkot. <laughs> and no rabbi was going to marry us. <laughs> and, uh, but we did find a cantor who was not a rabbi and he was free to sing and perform the ritual. He later became a very close friend and a very famous rabbi today. Uh, this is Rabbi Ron Lipaz. I don't know if any of you know. Um, he has a very big um, uh, following um, in the valley uh, um, I forget the name of his, uh, um, of his uh, cultural center, but he's very, very famous, very liberal, incredible man, incredible intellect. And he came to me after one of my exhibitions and he asked me to paint him. So this is very interesting for a rabbi to ask to have their portrait done, right? It doesn't, doesn't happen every day. And it was a most remarkable experience. If you look at this image, let me see. If you look at this image, what are maybe three things that strike you first about it? It's only part of the face. It's only part of the face, right? And if we were more specific, it's half of the vertical face. So there's only one eye, right? Anything else that we should add? The light is the first thing I noticed. Yes. So as we're looking at the image, the image itself, if you become from his point of view, he's encountering the light. It's not the painting that's illuminated. It's him coming to the light, right? Should we say a third thing? I, I mean, I noticed the eye color first, and I don't know if it's just because that's where my eye was drawn, but it seemed... A combination of like hopeful but also dulled. 
very, very interesting as well because this I is going back to our conversation, right? This is coming back to the witnessing. The job of the rabbi is so much the witnessing. What does he have to witness? Everything. The birth, the circumcision, the most amazing holidays, the coming of age, death, sorrow. And he has to sit and absorb it with this impartial eye for everything and everyone that he sees. He has to be completely open, non-judgmental, right? So the way that kind of a little bit you describe this eye. I should say that this painting is taller than me. So it's about uh, um, six and a half feet tall painting. So the face is, you come to it as a whole entire body, right? The face is the size of the body. So it kind of hits you in the gut when you see it. What is the second half of the face? Um, your rabbinical students, correct? There is the part of the face that you show, and there's the part of the face, the face that is unseen. You listen to the others, but who is going to listen to you? Who are you gonna tell your problems, your suffering, your, your understanding? So the second half is seemingly unpainted, but when you stand it in a way that unpainted part, that space, that blank space to the right of him becomes activated and the viewer begins to see the unseen. I'm always very interested. I'm not interested in a kind of art that digests for you. I don't want you to sit back on the couch and have the popcorn and enjoy the movie. I want you to make the movie. I want to project the light and I want you to hold the camera. That's what I want the viewer to do. It also talking about seen and the unseen, we have of course uh, the idea of the representation in Judaism, what is allowed, what is not allowed, right? And it's a very interesting concept when we think about no pictures in Judaism, no representation in Judaism. Because there is. Where is it? Mostly, it's the text. The text becomes so complicated, so descriptive, so rich, that almost no painting can come close to it. And I have to give you an example how much uh, the text has become an image in Judaism. And of course, I don't have to teach you that. You know that already. But my personal example, when I was doing my research about Metatron, I wanted to find an image of the archangel to see if it's ever been represented. So I could compare what I thought was a representation of Metatron in the Christian painting to one from the Jewish tradition. And as I started searching all over the world to the greatest scholars, everybody said, no, I don't know such an image. I don't know such an image. And then one great scholar in Jerusalem said, I have it. Mm. I will send it to you tomorrow. I couldn't sleep all night. I was shaking because depending on this image, my theory was either right or wrong. When I woke up and I opened my computer, I found an attachment. It was a JPEG, but it was a picture of a text where Metatron is described in some apocryphal writing. So for him, that writing was the image of Metatron. He didn't even differentiate the two, right? And again, we have this idea, why do I tell it to you about seen and unseen? Because the words make the unseen seen, almost more physical. Another example, if you watch even a silly movie like Harry Potter versus reading it, once you see the movie, you can't see your characters that when you were reading, they were so real, they're so dimensional, and now they're Hollywood flat and unenjoyable, right? So this is the painting in the way of the rabbi making the unseen scene. A painting, painting the, the, the blank. Questions here, comments, any disagreements or ideas? Do I still make sense? <laughs> I do have a, just like a, 
Um, I, I'm really appreciating sort of the background, all, all the background that you're giving us in all these paintings. Um, and obviously when you hang up your painting besides the abstract that's next to it, you can't share all these stories. And I'm just wondering as an artist, is there, does it feel frustrating? Is there an acceptance that all the nuances and all the background that goes into these paintings, all the philosophy that you're employing is going to completely be missed by most of the viewers. And as an artist, how do you, how do you sort of like handle that, either that frustration or that acceptance? Brett, thank you for that question. I um, don't believe that the, uh, from what, what you heard me say already, you probably can hint, get a hint that I don't believe that the artist holds the meaning of the work of art. Hmm. And so much so that when we get to older art, it's easier because there's not a lot written. And uh, I don't believe art historians hold the meaning either. They make up so much stuff, it's unbelievable. But when we get to 19th century and 20th century, we have a lot of writing by the artists. And some artists on purpose mystify the viewer. They actually tell lies. Dali, Salvador Dali was one example. He loved to tell uh, paradoxical lies that were not true about his art. And many artists do that because simply I think they know that they don't know. <laughs> they can start something they can start the ball rolling and it could have been completely fascinating to them and to the people near them. But who am I painting for? Me, in quotes, because we already talked that there is no me, it's a larger me. Who are we making art? Who are you reading for? Who are you assembling that knowledge for? It's for somebody who hasn't been born yet. And it's such a way we find out that in art, we know for sure there is no time. There is no pe present, past, and future. I feel it so strongly, I could talk to physicists and prove to them, time is a complete construct. So when you're making art, you're actually making it for the viewer who hasn't been born yet. So I cannot worry about what they will know or not know. But in another way that I will tell you, um, I don't just paint. Uh, for me, painting, is more of a sense of a touch, a physical touch, a connection. And this I hope that will answer your question even much better. I always paint human beings because there is nothing more exciting to me than what's happening between us right now. Even through this medium, these chords and this virtual reality, I feel you. I feel our moment in time. Moreover, I'm feeling not just each one of you, but us as a group. There's a kind of a sensation that we created. This feeling is what's atemporal. If I'm able to paint that, that can go like a time capsule forward in time. How do I do that? I do it not through painting, but through touching. And for that, I'm gonna be right back. I'm gonna show you something. This is what I use. Does anybody know what, what this tool is usually for? Wait, let me stop sharing so we can see you. Okay, do you see her bigger now? That's how you made the, uh, the markings on the painting? Yes. So what do you, can you guess what you would usually use it for? It's not meant for painting. For clay? Yes, yes, absolutely. This is a clay tool. So you're supposed to sculpt in three dimension. So when I paint, I do not paint like this. I try to feel the dimension of the being. I don't want to tell you the lie of the illusion that light hits here and dark is here so I can trick you in thinking that this is three dimensional. I want to take my tool and rub it around and feel the dimensionality for every nook and cranny of your body. And with that, I'm convinced with the, every nook and cranny of your soul. For me, the two are indivisible. This is another truth that I discovered for myself as an artist, that the soul is existing not inside, maybe I'm being sacrilege right now, but I see it, I feel it as a person. It exists irreplaceably 
with the skin and every part. There's no one part of the body that's dominant. Head is not better than toe. Some people have more soul in their toes than others in their brains, and we know that, right? Nothing political to be mentioned. Um, <laughs> but it's really amazing. And for this, I'm going to walk over to one of my paintings and to show you what happens up close. So hopefully you'll be able to experience. Sorry for raggedy jumpy. Well, I'm gonna try to walk with a camera. Let me just untie it for a second. Upside down. Let's see. So here's the painting. Oops. Um. Can you see the texture? Everything is sculpted. Can you guys see it? Yes. Yep. Okay, so I try to go back to my station now. I hope that was worth the field trip. It was. <laughs> um, so this sense of tactility, that sense of touch, that sense of excavation, that sense of engraving is also a play on the meaning of graven image and clay. You mentioned clay. Um, we go back very much to the Torah and to the creation of men. Adama is earth, right? Adam, Adama is earth. Man is man of earth, of clay. So if we are sensing this creation, then we're getting closer to understanding and witnessing of the miracle of God. Amen. <laughs> uh, other questions, comments? I'm going to share the screen again so we can look at another painting. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a series, also very tall. Um, imagine very narrow and very tall. And they were ma made in conjunction with the Days of Awe at Hillel Center. Has anybody ever been to Hillel Center during the high holidays at UCLA? They turned their, their 3,000 or 5,000 square feet of exhibition space into basically uh, a synagogue. And people come and pray and their uh, holidays, high holidays observed. And these paintings hung in the very sacred space that was transformed into the ritual for the holidays. And they watched everybody as they prayed. Uh, there is an image I'd like uh, Rotem to bring up where there's a young man sitting in front of a Torah. Oh, hang on. That, this one? Yes. This is one of those paintings. You could see the scale. And you could see this a kind of an impossible situation of uh, images entering a Jewish space during a ritual. This probably was the happiest day of my life to witness this. Mm. And what was so amazing, the rabbi in that space, he's a young progressive rabbi, during the holidays asked me to come up on the podium as a secular Jewish woman artist to talk about my idea of the soul and how these paintings participated and the ritual and the mystery of even pulling the soul out with a shofar. And I spoke as an artist, as a secular Jew, of my understanding of the soul. And you could see here uh, a very sacred moment. This young man was entrusted to hold the Torah in front of my painting. This is his most important moment that he gets to hug and hold the Torah. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a uh, something not so profound, but a little bit of a joke, a little bit something funny that happened uh, because he was in this moment and I was crying from happiness. And then with the scroll of the Torah, he was about to poke my painting and make a hole in it. And I didn't know what one does when, the, you know, what do you say? Excuse me, sir, don't 
don't don't poke the, the, the painting with the Torah. <laughs> it's completely inappropriate. And actually the rabbi saw me being very nervous and not being able to say anything. He said, it's okay. And he asked him to move. He said, it's okay. But it was a very funny moment where life, real life and something sacred comes together. Uh, the days of awe um, is actually one of my favorite moments during the Jewish holiday. Um, I I don't know how you feel about it, but for me, um, it's, a, it's a very much a painter's moment, an artist's moment, a philosopher's moment, uh, because you are, you're really absorbed in communicating with God. Most of the holidays are understanding the relationship with God. But during the days of 10 days of awe, ah, the, the emphasis becomes understanding yourself and others. Your job is to reconcile everything that you've done wrong and everything that's been wrong to you. So it's a human time on the human terms. And this is a moment when we could really say, who am I? Who are we? What does it mean to love? What does it mean to hate? What does it mean to forgive? This is what these paintings are about. If you had to say, what are they about? Mm -hmm. uh, the narratives are there, but the narratives are also experiences tactically, physically, so I don't feel my necessity to be there to explain it to you. It is my hope that when you look at these images, if you look at the third image from the left, you see that older woman looking out, that you would feel her humanity, that you will he feel her history of every wrinkle of what she's lived, that you will ask a question, what caused her to age? And what are these eyes asking? What are these eyes looking at? And how would I look like when I get there? What does my mother look like or my grandparent look like? Uh, how does my neighbor look like? Why? Uh, that's what I mean. So this is a very long answer to how do I feel if people didn't know my stories? <laughs> Any comments here, questions? Genia, uh, my question about this is, um, well, I have many questions, but the one question that I'm gonna be asking, um, can you tell us, let's stay in that realm of the stories behind the works for a little while longer. Can you tell us um, about your relationships with those people? I, okay. I, think, I think I recognize one of them as, your, as a long time inspiration of yours. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, it's interesting because I also will show you this book. Uh, Rotem, I'm not sure I've shared this with you. No. So this is um, images of paintings in the Bible. And the Canadian scholar wrote um, a religious philosophical statement using all of the great artists. I mean, there is Rembrandt here, uh, some of the greatest artists that um, ever lived. And he commissioned me to make his portrait Wow, wait, let me stop, let me stop actually, sharing so we can see. Can you show it again? I just stopped the sharing screen so we can see it. Oh, wow. And he had commissioned me a portrait as, as actually as one of the evangelists, one of the religious writers for the text. And the reason, so this is a kind of a backtrack story. The reason this happened, because many years ago, almost 20 years ago, I met a young man then, an older man now, whose name is Mark Snyder. And Mark was a professional artist model, but when I saw him, something remarkable happened to me. I felt the possibility of everything. Um, when you meet, this is Mark actually on the far right. Do you see him? And he's the second image and the, and the image on the far right. Um, when you meet a soulmate, that could be your child. When your child is born and you just, the light pierces your heart and you know this is your child. When you see your parent or your loved one, your husband or wife, a similar thing happens when an artist meets their model. This is a relationship that's very seldom talked about, but an incredible one and one that the story of which I am dedicated to tell. Uh, there was a movie that was made about Mark and I. Uh, it's called The Model's Artist. 
because the job of the model who works for an artist is called the artist model. You probably all heard this expression, the artist model. But this movie is called the model's artist. What if the emphasis is changed? What if it's not the model who's serving the artist, but what if nobody's serving, but rather it's a collaboration? What if Mark allowing me to understand who all of you are through his being? And he became my, not my muse, but I would say more of a collaborator. And we worked for 20 years. Uh, I painted him as an apostle. I painted him as a beggar. I painted him as anything you could possibly make, uh, a guru, uh, um, an amazing uh, uh, evil, a uh, flying demon, uh, just every possible reiteration and simply as Mark himself. And one of those paintings was actually noticed um, um, by the, the writer of this book. And that's what gave him an idea that I could paint him in being himself, but as a writer uh, of a biblical text or evangelist. Um, so that's, a, again, a long story to answer. Uh, the woman who is in the, in the paintings is, her name is Susanna. And Susanna was introduced to me by Mark. So it's very incestuous. Um, I'm very, very uh, picky at my models, but when I work with them, it's for a long time. And remember where we started, blank slate, right? Covering everything up, like you've been born just today. So when I paint, if I painted your portrait, I could start tomorrow again. And each time, each experience of painting you is tactily allowing me to feel you a little bit closer but it's never just you yet. Each time it's a blank start. Each time our umbilical cord gets closer and closer until we can become one and the portrait is truly born. And then the viewer doesn't need you and doesn't need me, doesn't need the stories. It will stand in front of that portrait and it would feel it right inside their own gut. They will feel the humanity. They would feel uh, 2020. April 1st, not a fool's, uh, April Fool's joke. April 1st, 2020, in that painting, in that moment, like the message in the bottle. Let's take a look at another painting. This is also Susanna. Uh, <clears throat> this is reducing the painting. This is a huge painting. It's a wall size painting, reducing the painting to the organ of the eye but not on how necessarily we would expect it. Um, make sure one very quick anecdote with you. May? Yeah. Okay. Um, my favorite art critic or philosopher who's ever been to my studio was my gardener. My gardener knocked on my studio and said, I noticed you making art. Can I come in and take a look at what you're doing? And I said, of course, it'd be my pleasure. He walked into the studio and the very first thing he did, he took off his hat because he wanted to mark, I mean, if he was Jewish, he'd put on the hat, right? He wanted to mark the sacred space of creation. Wanted to mark that the outside and the inside space was different. To me, that already gave shivers to my body. No, no great art historian walked in or critic and take off or put on a hat or garment changes the appearance to experience art. That was very profound to me. And then he looked at a painting like this and he just said, my God. And there were lots of portraits hanging. And he said, mountain, rivers, and valleys. That's mm -hmm. what he saw. He saw mountain, rivers, and valleys. He didn't see faces and eyes. He saw the mountain and rivers of our bodies and our souls. He was a gardener, but he was the greatest philosopher I've ever met. So if you look at this painting, this is actually painted after this encounter. And I really wanted to reduce myself to the tiny little size of an ant and feel like what would it be to crawl on the body, on the mountains and valleys of the eye and feel that experience. So what I'm trying to show you here is the depth, the journey, the pool, the watery pool of the white substance where the eye is swimming, the dry land, the, the cliffs and the drop offs. So if you look at maybe a Leonardo da Vinci's uh, landscape behind Mona Lisa, you could sense 
um, this, I'm not saying that I paint like this, no, not to flatter myself, but this sense, sensation of the sacred in the landscape, for me, it's the sensation of the landscape of the sacred in our bodies. And we can flash a couple more images and then I'll let you rest. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're going to talk about looking, then we're going to talk about who is looking and at whom. So this is a series where the position is changed and there's critical viewpoints either from above or from below. In a way, <clears throat> if you had a sense that you are if you're talking to God and looking above and the God looking from above to below and breaking the boundary, having a direct conversation. We have been spending a lot of time thinking about those perspectives of who is looking at whom and who gets to tell the story. Is it who is painted here, Su Susanna or God that she's looking at? Remember back to the rabbi that painted? Who are we looking at her looking? Are we looking at what she's looking? Let's do another one. This is actually here in the studio, so I'm gonna point very quickly one more time. There it is. It's a large scale painting. And, uh, um, this began the marking of something that I'm really experimenting for the new work. They're hybrids. If they were hybrids between painting and sculpture before, they're hybrids between painting, sculpture, and drawing. Most of this painting is made on a giant canvas with charcoal and very little oil paint. Um, perhaps it doesn't have as much significance to a non-painter, uh, but to a painter it does because when you have a huge surface that you've prepared, that's very costly and time consuming, you want to make a masterpiece on it. You want to make something finished. And the sketches of a little paper for something that's uh, less formal. Often we love the sketches more than the finished work because the sketches are more honest. The sketches uh, allow us to see the artist's mind. The sketches allow us to see the humanity. In the finished painting, often it feels cold. But artists very rarely allow themselves to make a giant sketch because it's just so time consuming and so expensive. And to break that boundary and to say, it's okay to have something unfinished. It's okay to have something that's not formal. On this scale, for an artist is very daring. And for me, it was a breaking point. I really wanted to retain the familiarity, the, the intimacy of a drawing on a huge painting scale. Hmm. We can go to the next. I think that's a repeat. Yes. Uh, this actually, you could see it's hiding behind me. It's back there. Hmm. Uh, the reason I wanted to show it to you, and perhaps we can finish here because I don't want to torture you all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what are you talking about? This is such a rare pleasure. <laughs> um, this is painted on a palette. So behind me, I don't, let's see if I could show it to you. You see, this is an old palette. And for all of the colors that you see around the rim of this painting, this is where I start my paintings. So at the upper left corner, you could see the white, right? And as you cascade down from the upper left down, you will see all the shades of going from the warm torn tones to the darker tones. And as we go to the right and go in a circle to the upper right, you'll notice the blues and the greens. So we have gone like the day and night in the painting. And this is the process of which many artists lay out the palette. They separate their day and night. That's very Jewish, I guess, separating things. Light and dark, uh, warm and cool. And from that, we can mix anything we want in the middle. We can mix any substance. We can create our golems. 
And when the palate reaches a, uh, at the end of the day, what you do, you clean the middle of your palate and you leave the little oil strips on the sides. And the oil takes weeks to dry, so you could keep dabbing into it, you could keep using it. And that's why I always say oil paint as opposed to acrylic is a living paint. It's like blood, right? That's why I use that metaphor. The middle you keep cleaning, eventually your palate keeps so rich that it becomes unusable. And when the palette becomes unusable, I have a tradition since I was a little girl, I make a painting in the middle and there's always a different painting and a different solution. So here I pulled all of the paints and I pulled the scars and the skin and the feeling and the suffering and the sweat and the tears of my time spent with this palette over a couple of years and that portrait was born. She is the portrait of that palette. And in a way, it's also um, another another way of thinking about the tactility and the three dimension dimensionality of um, oil painting a sculpture. It's another hybrid. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can see on the right where her eye starts to disappear into the paint. This is my favorite moment. When is the paint, and when it's in an image? When is it here? When it's not here? The barrier so thin, just like life and death. That person was just here and now they're gone. Where are they? These big questions we can ask, uh, start asking as an artist just by putting the first layer of paint, just putting the paint on the canvas. Mm -hmm. Something that wasn't there is now here. Something that was here is now gone. Amazing. Amazing the philosophy at the profundity of a simple painting act. Is there anything else we, we should look at? I think, no, I think that's it. I'll so my dream, I hope that uh, um, before long, we'll be able to gather together again. I would love to invite you all to come to the studio and see this in real life. My doors are always open. If you have comments, questions, suggestions, also please feel free to email me. And one day perhaps uh, I dream to this new work has nobody has seen it what's on the walls here i hope that it'll come as a new exhibition that will be called the witness and the idea came today as i was preparing for you the title came for it so you can take all the credit <laughs> it's a good title <laughs> thank you so much jenya and we also want to wish you and your loved one um a very happy passover because it's almost coming feels kind of kind of different this year but it's almost coming um if uh you guys have any further questions for jenya feel free to shoot them out and i could also share her email um they have seen your website and project ah and your art academy so they're well informed which is good um so thank you so much for bringing us into your studio. I'm so glad this worked out and I'm so glad that we were able to spend time with you. Just so you know, this is the best background ever. It looks perfect behind you. Um, and you guys, I will also make a note that we will resume our uh, meetings on April 22nd as we break for Passover next week. And Jenya, thank you again for taking the time to join us today. And I'm so glad we got you to take a shower. That's important. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank you, Jenya, and thank you guys so, so much. And uh, we'll see each other soon. Thank you, Jenya. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>